Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. You know what this is? If you guessed a piece of cherry, you're right. But this is no ordinary cherry. I didn't get this at the hardwood outlet. I got this from a special program called Trees to Furniture. It was started by a couple woodworkers who realized that urban and suburban trees that had fallen down or had to come down were ending up in the landfill or they were being burned. So they decided that they would save them, recycle them, cut them into timbers, and sell them to woodworkers. It's a great recycling story. And we'll go to Cincinnati first to talk about that, and then we'll come back and build a sink base from this beautiful cherry. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Well, Sam, I hope we can dodge the showers that they're predicting today. And we came into Cincinnati Airport this morning, but exactly where are we? Well, we're in the western side of Cincinnati. Actually, the neighborhood is uh, Western Hills. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the whole town has showed up for this event. Well, New Yankee Workshop comes to town. We're all here. So what's going on here? Well, the Cincinnati Park Board is taking this tree down. This is their job. They do this all over the city, take down trees that pose perhaps a public hazard. How many trees a year do they handle? Oh, at least 500 to 1,000 trees. Wow. All over the city. This is always the delicate part, making sure it falls exactly where they want it to go. It's good. All right, there it goes. Beautiful. That's Richard's the best tree we ever saw go down. Yeah. Nice job. Yeah, nice going, Richard. Thanks. Well, Sam, so much for avoiding the showers, huh? Yeah, well, we could always use the rain here. Now, what's this orange contraption attached to the back of this pickup truck? Well, this is a portable band mill, Norm. So you're going to cut this log into boards right here on the street? Yes, we are. Well, what's the advantage of that? Well, it's easier to haul the log away as lumber mm -hmm. as opposed to the entire piece. So how does it work? Well, it's basically like the bandsaw in the New Yankee Workshop, only turned sideways. I see. The blade is horizontal. And it runs along a track, but how do you get the log up onto Well, it? that's what this hydraulic device is for right here. It simply lifts the log up, rolls it onto uh, the mill so that it can be cut. I can hardly wait. Now, how many pounds will this thing lift up onto the mill? Well, three to 4,000 pound log, I think, easily. Pretty impressive. Yes. Well, Sam, I suppose it'd be nice if I volunteered to give him a hand, but I got a bump shoulder. Yeah, I got a bad back. So now he's just going to line everything up by eye? Yes. What, it, what they'll try to do is, if you can imagine, a line running through the very center of the log so that when they cut, they're getting parallel cuts to that imaginary line and see the kid. Boy, that does a real nice job. It's yeah. a nice, flat, straight cut. Boy, look at that oak. Isn't that beautiful? So what's going to happen to this wood? Well, next we'll stack it and dry it, and then I'll show you. I'd say you're a little late to get anything out of this tree, Sam. This is what's left of a 500-year-old bur oak tree. Norm, when this tree was a sapling, Columbus was setting sail for the New World. Wow, 500 years old. So I guess it just died of old age. Yes, it did. In 1996, it was blown over by a windstorm. But the limbs were so large that they it could be used for lumber. And I've been making furniture for the family. I made a table for the farmhouse. I'd like to show it to you. Love to see it. How much lumber did you get out of the tree? Well, we got about 1,000 board feet, Norm. Mm -hmm. Got about seven or 800 board feet left. So you're not going to run out anytime soon? No, not anytime soon. Here, let me show you the table. It's in the basement. All right. Wow, the design of this table looks familiar. It looks just like the trestle table I built in the workshop about 10 years ago. It was inspired by it, Norm. Nice job. And look at this oak. Look at the grain. I bet that chattered when it went through the surface planer. It sure did. And let me guess, this is a picture of the tree when it was still standing. Taken about 100 years ago. Wow. Well, Sam, congratulations to you and your associates on a great program. My hope is that one will get started in every city. It would be great for woodworkers. Thank you very much, Norm, and thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you don't suppose I can get my hands on some of this wood? Well, you know, I've got a load of black cherry headed your way. Can't wait to get it. Well, how's this for some beautiful wood? Sam sent me some of his best cherry wood for our sink base. Now, this is one of the side panels that we're going to have for the cabinet. If you'd like to build a version of our sink base, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, Sam didn't ship me the boards looking like this. They came looking like this. 
rough sawn. You can still see the bandsaw marks on the timber. And if you look at it closely, you can see that it's a little bit cupped, it's a little bit bowed, and it has a slight twist to it. And that's natural. That happens, happens during the drying process. But there's a whole procedure to get these pieces usable for our project. And the first step is to actually run one surface through the joiner to get it nice and flat. But before we use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I have one face that is perfectly flat, no twist, no cup. Now it's to the surface planer. Now to set my surface planer to start this process, what I like to do is find the thickest part of my piece, which here is about an inch and five sixteenths. So I'm going to set the surface planer at that measurement. It may not take off much, but I don't want the piece to get stuck in the planer. Now the way the surface planer works is that there's a cutter head in the top with three knives in it that spins at high speed. I want to take the freshly jointed surface and put it down on the table and the cutter head will smooth the opposite side. All right, with the surfaces smooth and the thickness I want, now I have to take care of the edges. Now if I put my board on the joiner table, you can see that the edge is not straight. It's touching at each end and it's up in the middle. And that's what they make these joiners for. A couple passes through, we'll straighten it right out. Well, that takes care of one edge. Now we can take it to the table saw, rip the other edge parallel, then come back to the joiner to dress it off. So that's how I take rough stock and turn it into usable boards to glue up panels or any other parts for our project. The next step is to sand these panels smooth using my wide belt sander. But before I run it through the sander, I want to scrape off any glue residue so it doesn't tear up my belt. Of course, you could sand this down by hand with a belt sander and a random orbit sander, but this wide belt sander sure makes it easy. With the panels sanded, I'm now ready to cut them for height. The first step is going to be to square up the bottom edge, and for that I'm using my panel cutter. It rides in the miter slot, and it makes a convenient way to cut these large panels. Now I can set my rip fence for the overall height, which in this case is going to be 34 and a half inches. I'll set the squared edge against the fence and cut the overall height. Here's a piece of plywood that I'm using for the fixed bottom shelf. That piece of plywood fits into a dado in the side panel. Now the dado has to stop just shy of the front, otherwise it's going to show. So I've laid out where I want it to stop. I've set up my router with a straight cutting bit. And I've set a fence that's equal to the distance from the edge of my router base to the edge of the bit. I'll just plunge down and run the piece through. Here I've made a rabbit along the top edge of my side panel using my stacked dado head cutter and a sacrificial fence. That rabbit will receive the cleats that will tie the sides together. With the dado now raised 3 eighths of an inch above the saw table, this rabbit will receive the plywood back. Now this piece of plywood will be a nailer by which I'll be able to attach the cabinet to the wall and that rabbit will receive the quarter inch plywood back. Now with my saw blade tipped to 45 degrees, I'm going to cut this overhang of my side panel to receive the top rail. With the same setup, I'll be able to do the opposing panel, except this time the top edge goes through first. You might have noticed that the three quarter inch plywood I'm using has a finish on it. 
We buy it that way from our plywood supplier. It has a very tough finish, and it'll save us a step later. And because I have plywood for the shelf, which is very stable, and I have solid wood for the side of the cabinet, I don't want to glue the entire joint. I'm just going to put some glue towards the front edge of the joint because I don't want that to move. Any expansion or contraction of the solid material will occur at the back of the cabinet. Now I'm just going to bring a square to the shelf, make sure it's good, and then toenail a brad through the joint. Now I'm ready for the top cleats, a little bit of glue in the rabbit, and with these cleats in, I'll have something to support the other side as I attach it. Now for the back cleat, and these cleats actually hold the top of the cabinet together as well as acting as a support for the countertop. Next is this cleat or nailer along the back, which I'll use if I attach the cabinet to the wall. All right, now let's attach the other side. And I think instead of bringing the side up on top of this piece, I'm just going to take the pre-assembled section and set it into the piece on the bench. All right, now I'm ready for the quarter-inch plywood back. And it slips into the rabbits of the side pieces and into the rabbit underneath the back nailer. And I'll secure that with some brads. This piece of cherry will cover the end grain of the bottom shelf. Now I'm beginning to form the front rail. I've mitered one end, and with one end mitered, I can set it in position, mark it for length, and trim the other end. Okay, let's check that for fit. Perfect, now let's glue it up and nail it in place. At the bottom edge of the front rail that I just installed is a horizontal piece. And that's just going to slide in and be nailed through the front. To secure the horizontal piece to the sides of the cabinet, I'm just going to put in one of these little glue blocks and secure it with a nail. Here I'm starting to work on the feet of our base unit the half columns will come down and sit on top of these. I've done the layout, and I'm going to cut it over at the bandsaw. Here at my oscillating spindle sander, I can smooth up the saw cuts. And I'm lucky because I have just the right size drum for the small radius. For the last few minutes, I've been nibbling away at the foot to create a notch which will allow the foot to sit over the side piece. And once this is installed, I'll be able to bring my toe kick right up against the back of the foot. OK, now some glue on the foot. Slip it over the side piece and attach it with a couple brads. Now another piece of cherry goes up behind the feet, and that becomes a toe kick. And now just a piece of scrap plywood, which I'm putting up right behind that toe kick so that it can't be pushed in. Now on top of the feet, I've cut a couple styles that will drop into place and be secured with some brads. Well, now I'm ready to turn a column that I'm going to cut in half and then apply to the styles that I just installed on the cabinet. So I have a square piece of cherry. The first thing that I have to do is locate the center. So I use this centering tool. I slip it over the edge of the wood, mark in one direction, spin it around, mark in the other direction. Now I want to give myself a little indicator point right on that cross. So I'll use a scratch all. Just Tap it in a little bit on each end. And that'll allow me to set it in the lathe more easily. But the first step is to take the drive center 
which is this piece. It has a point and a couple spurs on it, and it's tapered, so it fits into the lathe. Set that over the marks, and tap it in place with a soft mallet. Now I can take the whole assembly, slip it into the lathe on this end, and then on this end, bring the cup center up just about ready to touch, and then turn it in so that it sets on the end of the piece of wood. Usually it helps to spin it just a little bit as you bring it in. Lock it in place, make sure the tool rest is out of the way, and turn it on to see if it's balanced. That looks pretty good. Now, before I can do any turning, I also want to take some time to just use a little slip stone and just touch up the tools. And that's what I'll do before I leave tonight. We'll make the turning first thing in the morning. Good morning. I'm starting to turn the column that we need for our sink base. It's relatively simple. There's going to be a bead at each end and then a smaller, simple turning right down the middle. The first step is to make the blank round. So I start with this gouge. We simply put it on the tool rest, bring it up against the work, and slowly move it down. And I'll keep going until the piece is perfectly round. With the other hand, I want to hold the tool as far as I can on the end. That gives me good leverage. I keep my whole arm tucked into my body, which gives me good control. If I dig in too far, I stand the risk ruining the piece and also having the tool kick out of my hand, or even worse, having the piece come flying off the lathe and hitting me in the face. That's why I wear a full face mask. Okay, I'm satisfied with the results so far on this end. Now I'm going to move the tool rest down, line it up with the blank, and repeat the process. Okay, well that's good enough for now on the turning. What I want to do is put two marks, which will indicate the double bead at the top and bottom of the column. And I'll just turn the lathe on. Mark those. Now what I want to do is take a parting tool, and I want to go in just to this side of my mark and get it down to two inches in diameter. I'll check it with a caliper in a second. Now I've set a caliper to two inches. I'm going to see how close I am. And that's just a little bit snug, so I'll take just a little bit more. That should do it. Now I'll do the same thing at the other end of the column and then make a consistent diameter between the two points. Now I'm going to switch to this skew chisel and I'm going to go right in on this mark and make a little bit of a V groove. Okay, now I'm going to switch to a small gouge and just round over the corners. Okay, now I'll do the same thing down the other end. All right, now that takes care of the sanding. Now, one more little thing. If I just grab a handful of the wood shavings from the turning and hold it on the piece, it'll burnish it, and it gives it a nice, smooth finish. Now what I have to do is split this column right in half. So I've made a little bit of a cradle out of some scrap plywood, drilled some holes for the center. And I'm just going to use a finish nail and push it through so that it ends up in the center left by the lathe. And then I'm going to secure it with a couple brads. Of course, now I can pull these nails out and I won't damage my saw blade. Well, I sure hope this works. I don't want to have to turn another column. Worked great. To secure the column, or half column, I'm just going to put a little bit of glue on the back side, center it up by eye on this style, and then nail it from the inside of the cabinet. Now here are a couple pieces of cherry that I'm going to nail together to form an L-shaped piece.
from which I'm going to hang the doors. Now here at the bottom, I've notched it out to fit around the bottom shelf. Okay, now a little bit of glue on that edge. And this whole assembly slips in behind our column and gets secured with a few more nails. Now I'm just going to add a few decorative elements to this front panel to dress it up. And the first piece is some three-quarter inch stock that hangs out over the front about three-quarters of an inch. Now, above each of the columns, I'm going to build a little decorative rectangle out of half-inch stock. Here I'm running a quarter-inch wide groove, a half-inch deep, in all the rails and styles for the door. They'll receive the tenons from the rails, and they'll hold our panel in place. Here I'm forming the tenons that fit into my styles. And that's simply done by widening the dado, installing a sacrificial strip, and then setting the height so that with two passes, I get the right thickness tenon. Now, the doors on that project down in Tucson had the panels raised both on the inside and the outside. That makes for a more attractive door when it's open. It also keeps the plane of the panel even with the rails and the styles. So I'm just using my panel raising bit, which actually has a ball bearing on it, which guides the edge of the piece. All right, now for the assembly, a little bit of glue in the groove and on the tenon. And I'll slip a panel in dry. It just floats in the grooves. And then install the other style and clamp it up. Well, I'll let these doors dry for a little while, then sand the joint smooth, and it's off to the paint shop. Now, here's what our sink base looks like with one coat of a stain polyurethane combination called Bombay Mahogany. And what I like to do is just lay on a coat, nice even coat, and let this sit and dry for about eight hours. Then I give it a light sanding and put on another coat. Each coat will make the piece just a little bit darker. After two coats of this stained polyurethane, we're gonna add some additional protective finish, a coat of clear urethane. Because after all, this is gonna be used in the bathroom where there's gonna be a lot of water. It took a few coats of that stained polyurethane to get to the nice dark color that I wanted. As far as the countertop goes, we got lucky. I called on our old friend Carl Peterson, who specializes in Corian fabrication. And I told him that I wanted a top that would look like the poured concrete that Jim Meggs had spec. So what he did is built up a top so that it was two and a quarter inches thick, and did a nice big radius around the corners. Beautiful workmanship. Well, now that I have the vanity built, I guess I should find a luxury bathroom to put it in.